next up is uh, Moment Roberts, who is a data analyst at the uh, BBC, and will be talking about the Digital Public Space Project. Um, hello. So, uh, my name's Moment Roberts. I work on the BBC's Digital Public Space Project, and there are three things you should probably know about the BBC if you don't already. One is that we like to do things quite big if we can. Um, the other is that we like to do things when we have no idea what's going to come out of it. And third, we like to invent very silly names for things. Um, so the digital public space is something that stems from the idea of what on earth do we do with the BBC archive. And Part of it is we've got, as we're emerging into the, the digital world, we're moving into an environment that, that's a little bit unfamiliar for a broadcasting institution. And it's trying to figure out what part does an organisation like the BBC play in this digital space, which to most people is the internet. Um, last year we published the strategy review which has an equally silly name. It was called Putting Quality First and uh, that led a lot of people to wonder what came second. Um, but you'll notice the subtitle is the BBC and Public Space. Now it, it doesn't go to the trouble of defining what public space is, um, not in anything that makes much sense, but just pretend. Um, now, the one thing the strategy review did say is that we should open the archive up to the public. And if you want to download the PDF, if you're really bored, on page 18, there's this little bit here, which says... Opening the BBC's current and future programme library, as well as working with partners like the British Library, the BFI and Arts Council England to bring the other public archives to wider audiences. Which roughly translated means put it on the internet somehow. And my job is to figure out, A, whether we can, in a technical sense, and if so, to actually make it happen. Now, this was the strategy review produced by the BBC executive and anything kind of high level and strategic has to go to the BBC Trust. And so this went to the Trust last year and they came back and said, yep, now you have to do it. So we have to open the archive up to the public because we said we wanted to and then the Trust said go and do it. The only thing is, is that we didn't specify how we were going to do it. So we know, we know we do have to. We don't know when and we don't know how. And that's what this project is to, to try to figure out. And so we have the BBC's own archive, which contains quite a bit of stuff. Um, most people don't realise quite how big it is. and In fact, we didn't realise quite how big it is. We went on a two-year exploration exercise um, to delve into the archive and actually examine the breadth of it. And there's, I mean, it goes beyond just those four things. Um, there's a four million items of sheet music. Um, you know, there's, there's a ridiculous amount of stuff. Um, and, and a bit of it is digitised. We've got about uh, 206,000 digitised radio programmes and 23,000 digitised TV programmes. And um, there is a programme of digitisation that's ongoing and, fingers crossed, will keep on going. And what we'll end up with is an enormous digital tape library um, that we can just retrieve and transfer any of this stuff to, um, 
to spinning disks as we need to. Um, and so the Digital Public Space Project, the, the, the underpinning mantra is how do we maximize the value in all of that stuff? And we thought about it and we thought, well, a lot of what we're going to come up with here isn't just applicable to the BBC's archive. It's applicable to all of the cultural institutions in the UK. Now, all of the cultural institutions in the UK is quite a broad term and quite hard to define because once you start thinking about well, what constitutes cultural heritage, you get into, well, is YouTube part of that cultural heritage? You may not think about it as being that now, but in the future, you'll look back on it and go, well, actually, that skateboarding cat was actually quite a pivotal defining moment in the evolution of user-generated content. Um, we should probably preserve that as well as the metadata about where it came from. Um, but to begin with, we're just, we're just focusing on kind of the well-known um, well institutions. So this is just some of them. Um, fairly well-known institutions, and there are lots more, as you all probably know. And rather than take the approach of, well, we're going to do something here at the BBC, and then we're just going to hand it over to, to other institutions and say, yeah, go crazy. We could do something a lot more interesting. And so we figured, well, why don't we take all of these different catalogues and see if we can link them together. Ooh. And those arrows are entirely for illustrative purposes. The National Library of Scotland, although it is very good, I'm not sure it's necessarily the hub of all of the nation's cultural heritage. Um, if there's anyone from the NLS here... <laughs> but what we realised was that if, if we can create links between the different catalogues, then we can enable journeys between them that wouldn't otherwise be possible. Um, and what I'm going to talk about just in a moment is basically how we do that, um, or how we're trying to do that. Now, what I will stress is, at the moment, this is a prototype project. Um, we don't have long-term internal funding for it. It's a partnership, but it's still very tentative. If we can demonstrate internally and to the partners that what we're doing is quite a good thing and could work, it doesn't necessarily have to work right now, but shows the potential of working, then it could become something quite big and cool and useful. But right now, it's a tiny little thing that um, we hope will become something big in the future. Um, so I'm now going to talk about the technical bit. So every institution has one of these. It contains all kinds of stuff in a form generally best suited to archivists. And some of it will point at physical assets, some will, will point at digitised assets, some will point at no assets at all. It will just be information about something which you can no longer get. So we have some physical assets and some digital ones, and they're very exciting. I just pressed a button there, I don't know what I did. <coughs> so, what we thought was, we've got all of these different catalogues and they're in lots of different formats. And they come from a, a diverse range of institutions. So, you know, the, the way the Royal Opera House deals with data is very different to the way the British Library deals with their data for fairly obvious operational reasons. If we could express it all in a common 
way. And a way which allowed links between things and to the assets using a well-known grammar, then we could probably do something quite interesting with that. So what we're doing is taking dumps from each of the participating institutions who are, who are kind of joining us in the trial of this. And incidentally, there was no particular selection process. It was just those who knocked on the door first after we said, we'd kind of like to do this. The ones that actually provided us data quickest, they're the ones that we, we've been using. For each institution, we're publishing data as RDFXML on a currently private web server for each institution. And then that data is pushed into a central aggregator. And we're making use of a, a, a single golden rule for how the data is expressed, which is we give everything the URI and you make the data accessible at that URI. Well, that's actually not quite right because it's you give your assertions about everything a URI and you make those assertions accessible at that URI. Because multiple people may well describe the same thing in different ways. And you don't have to have one canonical identifier to rule them all so long as you, can, you have a means to reference between them. And so we push each of the structured bits of data expressed as RDF into our aggregator. And as it's pushed, the data from each of the catalogues is cached and evaluated. And the evaluation process does what you'd expect. For a new thing, is it like anything that we've seen before? fairly straightforward on paper, as you'd imagine. The evaluation process is a combination of straightforward logical um, processes. You know, if two things claim to be the same thing, then we can, you know, that's an explicit assertion that we can deal with. But there's also some heuristic stuff there as well. So as the data's pushed in, we'll build a full text index of it. And then we can mine that index as more stuff is pushed in and evaluate the similarity and score it. And if the score falls within a certain percentile, then we can say, oh, well, that's close enough for us. And um, those particular algorithms have been the cause of some late nights. I can tell you for that. But we also match the things to external sources. So... DBpedia Lite, GeoNames, Freebase, that sort of thing. Um, and what we do is we create a stub object. So we group everything, because this is, this is something that's aimed at opening the archives up to people, as normal people, man on the street, rather than archivists. We, we're kind of rearranging the catalogues as they come in a little bit. So we break everything down into being a thing, a person, an event, a place, or a collection. Uh, collections are, are curated at source, so they're, they're kind of a little bit separate. But people, places, and events are fairly obvious as to what they are, and things is pretty much everything else. Um, now, the aggregator... For everything that comes in, it generates a stub object. The stub object has the type reflecting how we've categorized it, as well as an aggregate of the types of all the things it's been matched to. So in this example, we've got George Orwell. This is from one catalog. and We've got Eric Arthur Blair from another catalog. And there's an explicit relationship in the source data between them. And we've reflected that, so there's just one stub object. So there's just one entry for George Orwell. 
and you can see all of the data from all of the catalogues that we've ingested relating to that specific person. So we're dealing in terms of real-world things rather than um, necessarily the, the individual entries in the catalogues. And we express the relationships between the stubs and the source entities as SCOS matching predicates. So everything from a... Well, in principle, you could have a no match. You really wanted to. Maybe you want to have a negative assertion. Um, all the way up to an exact match. And then we also take the, any references from one bit of source data to another source bit of data. We reflect those as references from stubs to stubs. Now, we call them stub objects because they have very little information themselves. All they are is references to all of the things that have, they've been matched to. So they're just a reflection of that evaluation process. Um, and it's quite a hard, a very hard constraint, a design constraint in the whole thing that whatever data goes in, you should be able to get it back out again verbatim. Um, and so we don't need necessarily to have lots of data attached to the stops. You need about enough to do top level browsing and indexing. So we'll, we'll take in titles and a, a summary and a depiction and the rest of it all the other information we just leave in the source objects and the references are there you can just as a, as a consumer of that you can just follow your nose and part of the reason we cache the data is so that it's readily accessible to a client application in an ideal world you know, internet connections were um, you know, connectivity was a, a, a lot better generally, um, a lot lower latency, um, and everyone had bigger, fatter servers. We'd just not bother the caching. we just have the stub objects that link out, and job would be a good one. And so, I can show you, excitingly, hold on to your hats. Uh, that's... The wrong one. Where are we gone? There we go. This is an actual stub object for the Republic of Brazil. Um, I won't bore you to tears by talking you through it, particularly. I could, but I'm not going to. Um, but the key things are it, it's a place, it's taken on the types of, uh, it aggregates the types of the source data that it's attached to, and it's got some references out. So it, it references uh, an entry at DBpedia Lite, and it also references some source data. Now, that, that particular bit of source data came from BBC News on this day, which I cheekily scraped and turned into RDF. Um, it's a very nice data source, actually. It's quite varied. Um, and we've got a, a depiction which has come from um, DBpedia, and we cache a copy of that and turn it into lots of different sizes for easy use. Um, but on top of this data, you can start to build some interesting user interfaces. Um, and bearing in mind, we're keeping with that one golden rule. So we give everything a URI, and we make the data about it available at that URI. Which means building a client, uh, you know, a user interface on top of that is, is a doddle. So the one at the top right is basically what, what will be our default UI. In order to get people to build stuff, you need to give them a way to browse what's there in the first place. So we, we've... We're building a fairly straightforward, mundane, this is what it looks, kind of BBC-ish user interface to it. The one in the corner there is um, one who, which needs a little bit of rebranding before it goes anywhere public. Um, 
It's called Forage, and it's a, a search-driven debugging UI. So that, that's just enter some search terms, here's all the stuff, and it will present you the, the raw data. Um, and it shows you the relationships between it and nearby things. Um, and then this one on the left is a user interface that we commissioned um, a firm to produce for us. Um, we asked them to produce something which was a little bit left of field. And they also have a lot of experience in video aggregation. You would think that being the BBC and having this plan of opening up the archives, it would be really easy for us to find lots of AV material that we could associate with all the entries we've got. And we will, but it's not that easy. In fact, what we've found generally is that getting anything internally is far more difficult than getting useful sets of data out of the partners in the project. We're quite good at building the software, but actually getting the data sets is a whole other kettle of fish. It will change over time, and there's a will, and you know, it's part of the strategy. We have to do it. But getting to that point, nothing ever moves quickly. Um, and this UI, what it does, it, it, it combines our aggregated data with this company's existing video aggregation data and puts them together to give you some nice, here's some videos and whatnot about the, the data that's there. Um, there's a few kind of hard constraints that we're, we're trying to keep to and some... Um, Yeah, um, essentially, we want to maintain the provenance of everything. Very important. Um, we want to ensure that if the data is preserved, but technology has changed beyond all recognition, so 150 years' time, this is an archive project, that um, you will still be able to do useful things with it. Um, and so we're, we're looking at things like digitally signing the source data as it goes in, um, which is a, a slight challenge in, with RDF. Um, and ultimately, it will be open to all comers as a read-write store. The long term is that we don't actually need an aggregator at all, and uh, the, all of the source institutions are able to publish their own data and links to all the other peoples in a nice linky fashion. Um, but that's a way off, so we're considering this a stopgap. Um, yeah, so there's a blog post that I did um, a couple of months ago on the BBC internet blog. More silly names. Um, which kind of gives you pretty much what you've just seen, but slightly more coherently. Um, yeah. Any questions? Um, I was just wondering, um, I mean, this is awesome and it's a huge amount of work and even just the overlay onto the RDF that you have at the end. I don't know what the BBC's policy is with this, but is there any chance of open sourcing all the code? Uh, yes, we will be open sourcing the code. Um, it's, it needs some paperwork doing yeah. uh, and we need to get to the end of this phase of the project. Um, the time scales on this basically are if, if everything goes well, we would like to, and we, I think we've said as much publicly, so it should be okay for me to make this statement. Um, we would like to open it up to the academic community, a, a, an actual running version rather than just the code, within about 18 months. Um, 
how much of the, all of the metadata should be fine, obviously, but how much of the, the digitized assets, um, especially things like TV programs, we're not too sure about, you know, there's things like Era Plus and, and so on, and we're trying to muscle things into the right frameworks to make that happen. But the code should be open source within a, a, a fairly short space of time. Um, but as the author of it, um, it's not about to set the world on It's fun, but no promises. Uh, this is perhaps a, a bit of an unfair question because you d deliberately set yourself up that you know, sort of talking from a technical perspective. But you, you brought to our attention the fact that the, you know, sort of the BBC defines a, 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 a phenomenon which it calls the public space and kind of sets it as a, as a kind of a, a national interest. Uh, and very much, you know, sort of glancing through the um, public space document that you, you ruled out, you know, sort of, this is a, this is, a, you know, a political move, and we see, we see that um, actually um, there, are, you know, there, there is perhaps some hope that um, profit-driven enterprise is not seen as the, you know, sort of the only lasting and durable guarantor of independence at the moment. So what can we, you know, sort of in the sense that we are very much engaged in the same sort of activity, you know, so we talk about open access, you know, sort of in research and in the universities, but it, we are really talking about a public space rather than a, a private and owned space. How do, how do our activities, you know, sort of start to recognize each other and talk a common language and, you know, sort of go beyond, you know, sort of, oh, you do cultural heritage and we do research? Um, it, I think the, the it's, it's a difficult one. Um, I think the edges are always fuzzy and um, I think we're getting better at it as well. I mean, on this project specifically, we, you know, we've been talking to JISC and to the OU, obviously, um, as we have a long-standing partnership with them, and with the University of Westminster, amongst others. Um, so we're not, you know, we're not trying to, to draw a line in the sand and say, you know, this is, this is purely arts and culture. Um, and in fact, the, first, the very first step of this is, is we want this to be um, aimed and accessible to academics for research purposes. Um, the BBC as an institution, um, you know, I, I'm on paper, although I work in the, the archive department, which is part of vision, I'm also part of research and development. Um, and we do like our research. Um, we're you know, we are very much open to having conversations and trying to find the best way to, to meet everybody's needs. Uh, I can't promise that the entirety of the organisation shares that view, but what I can say is that it's the direction it's moving in, whether everybody likes it or not. Um, and if it's not going to get there, you know, of its own volition, it's going to get dragged there. Um, it has no, there is no choice but to engage with as many different interests as possible. Um, sometimes those are good and sometimes those are bad, um, depending on your perspective. But the academic community is, is a very, very big and significant part of that, and that's only going to get bigger over time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um,